All right. Thanks, Emily. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm very excited that Heather Dewey Hagborg is here tonight. Um, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to work with her and get to know her during her bio art residency at the Science Center um, in the labs of Integral Molecular in 2019. So Heather is so smart and her work is always so innovative and it's, it's a great pleasure to have her here. Um, so the work that, that Heather created at the Science Center during her residency has been exhibited nationally and internationally. And I'm looking forward to working with Heather again on a solo exhibition to be held at the Esther Klein Gallery in 2022. So definitely stay tuned. Um, so Dr. Heather Dewey Hagborg is an artist and biohacker who is interested in art as research and technological critique. Heather has shown her work internationally at major art institutions and events, um, such as the World Economic Forum, the Transmedial, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Her work is held in public collections around the world, and her controversial work has, has been widely discussed in the media, from the New York Times and the BBC to Artform and Wired. Um, so Heather has a PhD in electronic arts from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, She's a visiting assistant professor at, um, of interactive media at NYU and Abu Dhabi, and an artist in residence at the Exploratorium and an affiliate of Data and Society. And she's also a co-founder and co-curator of Refresh, which is an inclusive and politically engaged collaborative platform at the intersection of art, science, and technology. So without further ado, um, please welcome Heather Dewey Hackborg. Thank you, Angela. That's a very nice introduction. Really nice to be here with everyone. And uh, I think, you know, it's really striking uh, entering into the last conversation. So I really appreciate the important conversations that are happening in this space. So thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm going to try to share the screen. Let's hope everything works well. So Hopefully you can see a title slide. Looks great. Wonderful. Okay. So I'm Heather Dewey Hagborg. I'm an artist and a biohacker and an educator. And I'm going to be talking to you today, kind of jumping off from this idea of lovesick, which was my project that I worked on at Science Center, and using that as a way to talk more generally about biotechnology and intimacy and ways of depicting biological futures. So I've been working with biotechnology as an artist for a while, uh, since about 2012. Before that, I was working uh, more with machine learning and computer science as an artist. And so I've made work algorithmically generating 3D portraits of strangers based on DNA that they leave in public. So starting in 2012 with the series Stranger Visions, I would pick up things like cigarette butts and shoot up gum off the streets of New York bring them to the world's first biology lab, GenSpace, that I just opened up down the street from me in Brooklyn, extract DNA from them and analyze it to computationally generate possible versions of what someone might look like based on genomic information. And so this was an early piece that was meant to call attention to the vulnerabilities of the body of our biological data to show that we're shedding this most personal of information all the time without giving it a second thought. And anyone could come along and pick that up and mine it for information. So it was an early kind of hacker piece, really showing these security vulnerabilities in our bodies and showing kind of how they connect with other kinds of security vulnerabilities that we see, that we think about and discuss in regards to electronic surveillance, in regards to kind of corporate uh, exploitation and extraction of our data. In Probably Chelsea in 2017, I expanded this and in a way uh, meditated on this earlier piece in a collaboration with the whistleblower Chelsea Manning, who uh, was arrested for making public the prevalence of torture and civilian deaths in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. So in this work, which celebrated her release from prison, uh, I worked with Chelsea Originally, I, uh, she sent me her, her DNA from prison. So she sent me cheek swabs and hair clippings and I extracted DNA from those, went through the same process I went through in Stranger Visions to create a genomic portrait of her. And this process basically snuck her image out of prison. So it was a way of kind of 
surreptitiously uh, combating the censorship that had blocked her from being seen. So no one was allowed to visit her, no one was allowed to photograph her. When she was released from prison, we put together this exhibition together as a collaboration to celebrate her release. And what you can see here are 30 different interpretations of the same DNA data. So these are 30 different Chelsea Mannings that you could read into her DNA. And so what we're hoping to do with this piece is really to draw people into thinking more critically about what the genome means, about reductionism, genetic reductionism, about how we think of the role of DNA in our lives and to say we could be many different possible people based on the same data. And use that in a way also to push back against the uses that we're starting to percolate, uh, in particular in policing, around this use of the DNA uh, mugshot, as they call it, um, which is forensic DNA phenotyping. That's the official term. We can definitely talk more about this in the Q&A. But this is just a little bit of background so that you get an idea kind of where I was coming from, what the background of that was. So I made a number of works that were very political, dealing with DNA and identity. And after going through this, you know, spending a number of years on these processes, doing a lot of work, talking in the media, publishing articles, giving a lot of talks, I kind of came out the other end and I felt like, well, this is important work, but there's something missing. There's something of myself missing in this work. And this is personal relationships. This is what it means to be human on an intimate level. And so I realized that what I was missing was to show the future outside of just a political future, because of course the political is totally entwined in our intimate relations as well. And so I started thinking, how can I bring these kinds of intimacies that I think will be coming, the, the reshaping of our intimacies through biotechnology into my artwork? And so I want to focus today primarily on these three more recent works that explore biotechnological futures and intimacy from a solo show I had last year called At the Temperature of My Body. And maybe at the end, I'll give you a sneak peek also of the work that will be shown in Philadelphia um, next year. So at the temperature of my body, so it's purposefully at the temperature of my body and not at the temperature of the body or a body. So it's meant to be personal and signifying that it's about me. And it's an exhibition that's a meditation on intimacy, desire, and spirituality, anticipating a world of emerging biotechnological rituals. There are three works that make up the show, and they correspond roughly to kind of three phases of love, desire, attachment, and grief. T3511, lovesick, and spirit molecule. And through a frame of speculative, or I would say semi-speculative narrative, they introduce science that's entirely real. So my practice, while it shows a future that might be coming and it points in that direction, it's always grounded in real hands-on work in the lab. It's always informed by conversations with scientists and by experiments that I carry out myself. So each of these works is strongly narrative and deeply personal. And each also raises significant ethical and political issues, as you'll see. So I want to start by sharing an excerpt with you of the piece T3511. A cell is a history. A cell is a home. A cell is a hole. A cell is a cage. A cell is an electric fence enclosing your legible unknown. To break the cell is to trespass the most intimate of spaces. Dear donor T2305, I received five milliliters of your saliva in June. It wasn't hard to get. Using my academic email and mailing address, I simply said it was for research, genetic testing the truth. When it arrived, I moved it quickly to the freezer to keep it fresh and alive. I sent two milliliters of your fluid for sequencing, and then I waited and waited and waited. Six weeks came and went, and then another time over. 
the company was experiencing unusually long processing times. When the results finally trickled in six months later, I devoured your profile in a single sitting. You are 46 years old with dark brown eyes, a full head of brown hair, and few freckles. You toss and turn in bed, and you enjoy a savory midnight snack. You like to run for miles, for hours, and this keeps you slim, keeps your heart beating strong, and helps tame your sometimes wild thoughts. You were my first, and I think of you frequently. I imagine your face, your voice, the way you walk. I'm curious where you grew up. I worry for your health. And I wonder what you would think of me poring over your genetic details. I'd like to think you would be flattered, but you might be very angry. So I know we might have some scientists and some uh, people in general that are working in labs, working with cells, working with DNA in the room. And so one of the things that T3511 does is it shows the intimacy and the care work that is behind biological work. So showing how it is to work with a person's cells and data and DNA and that there is this level of that that is an incredible trust that it is a kind of incredible connection that you have with another person. This was something that really became clear to me through working with strangers DNA and then through working with Chelsea Manning's DNA, in particular with Chelsea, because with her, I got to know her first through her DNA. So before we ever met or exchanged a message, she sent me these clippings of her hair and cheek swabs. And I started to kind of pour over her genetic information and develop this relationship to her. And so suddenly I started to realize as I reflected on this and started thinking, well, what is the future of relationships in biotechnological times that one could really fall in love with someone through nothing more than their DNA. And that there was a level of that in scientific work as well. And so what you see in T3511 is a character, this kind of science fiction detective story romance about a biohacker who could be a scientist who purchases an anonymous donor's saliva online something that happens in labs around the world all the time, right? The, the purchasing and accumulation of various biological samples. She profiles their genetic data and proceeds to fall in love with them. And it documents what was a series of real experiments that I carried out where I went to a website, one of many websites that sell biologicals and bought a saliva sample. And I chose that saliva for a reason because I knew it would be easy to hack. So with very little effort, I could take this stranger's fluid and pour it into a standard kit purchased at the drugstore for direct to consumer genomic analysis. And many of you will be familiar with 23andMe as the most prominent of many of, of a whole spectrum of companies that have begun to offer genetic testing directly to consumers outside of a medical context. So you can buy a kit like this for $99, spit into it, drop it in the mail, and a month or so later, you get an elaborate report detailing your ancestry, genetic traits, with a raw data download that you can examine yourself. So I took my stranger's saliva, I put it in the kit, I mailed it in, and of course I received then a detailed 23andMe profile. And in T3511, I interpret this in a slightly poetic way. They have dark eyes, prefer salty snacks, don't prefer, I don't have much back hair. And so when I got their data, I back, I began pouring over it, imagining this person, thinking about what they might look like, what they might act like, and of course, how they might feel about me looking at their genetic material. And I wanted to see how easy it would actually be, not just to imagine a person based on their genome, as I did in Stranger Visions, but to really make a guess at who they are, to re-identify them. This came out of a, a body of research that was happening at this time showing how easy it was really to re-identify supposedly anonymous samples. And this gets at a real issue in biological research, which is that we kind of like to pretend that things, because they're de-identified or anonymous, that there's no risk really of re-identifying subjects if their name's taken off, but if other identifying information is taken off of it. And increasingly, we find that through just DNA alone, we can learn enough about people 
to actually figure out who they are. And what I found was that buying the saliva sample using commercially available services, I was able to re-identify this person within a few months. So this is a story about genetic vulnerability that you, that your data and that your cells may end up for sale. And that's a longer story. We can talk more about that as well because many of us are already sitting in biobanks around the world. And it's a story that your bio data is like your other electronic data, that it's hackable, that it's legible, that it draws this very vivid portrait of who you are. But it's also this very personal story because it describes an actual experiment I conducted in which I'm kind of narrating my own conflicted feelings about how to navigate the work itself. And it describes in parallel how it feels to fall in love, to open yourself, to make yourself vulnerable to another person. And it has this kind of parallel between being a detective, being a geneticist and falling in love because every love story is essentially a detective story. We're always putting together these clues about who this other person is. And over time, we accumulate more and more clues. And so this is what I was doing in the piece was kind of putting together these clues and guessing who this person was. So coming to Lovesick then, this is the outcome of the art residency that I completed in the spring of 2019 at Science Center um, with Integral Molecular, a vaccine and drug discovery company that many of you are probably familiar with. So together with the scientists at Integral Molecular, we invented a custom retrovirus which infects human cells to insert an extra copy of the gene that produces oxytocin. So the hormone oxytocin is implicated in feelings of love and bonding, empathy and connection. And I envisioned the work as an activist intervention to spread affection, physical closeness and attachment and to combat alienation, disconnection and hate. And I imagined a narrative world neighboring our own in which the virus was developed and gained mass adoption. And I'd like to share a bit of that story with you today. A biohacker becomes disenchanted with the way things are politically and personally and endeavors to change the world. She engineers a love virus to combat hate and alienation to make herself feel more connected. In addition to increasing a person's oxytocin levels, the virus also inserts a gene for red fluorescent protein as a reporter which leaves a telltale pink red glow on the skin of the infected. The virus works and the biohacker can see the invisible production of oxytocin through its genetic link to the glow of red fluorescence. She loses interest in her phone and begins to feel better, more social, more affectionate, cuddly. She finds herself suddenly holding hands with strangers her friends catch on and want in. The biohacker and her friends begin an underground cottage industry producing the lovesick virus. They encapsulate the virus in glass tubes shaped like the oxytocin molecule that are also charms. The virus is not to be taken lightly. After all, it changes your DNA forever. New rituals emerge breaking open the tube like a cyanide capsule, pouring the contents into one's mouth, holding for a minute, incubating and then swallowing. This is followed by a ritual and polyphonic group chanting of the oxytocin proteins, CYIQNCPLG. It begins as a cult phenomenon but catches on with the speed and reckless audacity you only see in people facing the end of the world. Glowing red symbolizes that you're part of the growing movement of connection. News feeds feature models and actors splayed on the grass entwined in a loving embrace with the subtle red glow of one who has been infected. A new group dance style emerges, the tangle, bodies enmeshed hand in hand, arm in arm, leg in leg, shapes subtly shifting in place. All the clubs now feature electric blue lights to enhance your glow. And family changes, prejudice based on blood, gives way to a radical openness. The people who are with you at any given moment become your family. And there's a return from certain rituals of the past, holding hands while walking down the street 
sometimes in huge groups before meals while dancing. And then there's the rejection of devices, giant piles of phones, tablets, laptops, flat screens, and a few VR goggles fill city streets like barricades in the French Revolution. It becomes the thing to demonstrate how over digital you are. There is, of course, the resistance, and they retreat even further into their parallel mediated world. But most people actually leave it behind and come together. We called it becoming one. So I worked on this piece before COVID, and there's a lot that we can talk about, I think, reflecting on what it means now. Um, and I wrote an essay reflecting on this called Love Sick Future, so I would be happy to share a, a link later as well. So maybe we can bring this up in conversation. But it really leaves me now with this question of how can we come together again after a virus has ripped us apart. And so I think what we see with COVID is this amplification of a trend that was already very much present before. And that's what lovesick is referring to, of course, which is this pulling apart, this feeling of digital alienation that has come with new technologies. And now, of course, they have become our lifelines and our only way that we're together here today, for example. But at the same time, many of us have never felt more alone and more distant. And the question is really how we will reconnect when we finally are able to again? And will we have this kind of outpouring of physicality and a need to, to touch and to be close to people again? And so Lovesick becomes now, I think, this device for imagining and kind of invoking this kind of future that at least I very much would like to see coming. So finally, the uh, third and final piece in this kind of body of work, Spirit Molecule, poses the idea of the genetic memorial. This is a collaboration with the artist and botanist Philip Andrew Lewis, and the project consists of a series of experiments that imagine a future of biotechnological mourning as we engineer a lost loved one's DNA into a psychoactive plant that's then consumed in a final journey of intimacy with the other. Spirit Molecule in its incarnations turns the gallery space into a living laboratory where legal psychoactive plants like morning glory, passion flower, tobacco, and liverwort become subjects of experimentation in genetic manipulation. The genetic material chosen for implantation is a 400 base pair bit of mitochondrial DNA that's passed down matrilineally from great great grandmother to great grandchildren, grandchildren, etc. And it's the same DNA that's often used for tracing maternal ancestry. The film, which accompanies the laboratory installation, tells the story of one such person who wished to transform their lost loved one, Ginny, into a psychoactive plant to connect with her one final time. And I'll just share a, an excerpt of that film with you now.
So I think I'll, I'll pause it there for now with the film, and uh, I'm really happy to share more of any of these uh, with anyone who's interested. So uh, this is Spirit Molecule um, 2018. We started working on this project. It's been an ongoing series of experiments. We've had, I think, four different incarnations of the project at this point. We're working on yet another incarnation. So we have kind of moved from um, our initial experiments where we just started gathering kind of local psychoactive plants at the first uh, site we were invited to and speculating about this idea, kind of imagining what it might be. And then in, in the next incarnations, we started really doing these hands-on experiments, collaborating with scientists, extracting D the DNA, and really working through the process of inserting it into the plant DNA as well. And um, the picture you see here, this was from the Broad Museum at the University of Michigan. This was an experiment in embedding uh, local DNA from community members there into uh, what ultimately we hoped would be liverwort, uh, a cannabinoid moss. Uh, but we started with some initial, uh, initial experiments with genetically engineered moss. And so the genetically engineered moss is the moss you see in these glowing tubes. And then it's mounted in this kind of giant installation of moss that we collected from the, from the local region. So Spirit Molecule is a narrative of love and loss and imagining bioengineering as a part of the process of grieving. The work invites the viewer to contemplate whether they would like to be transformed into a plant, or perhaps if they would immortalize their loved one in such a way. And this is just the, the latest experiment that we have here. Uh, this is called Dorothy, and this is a, a tobacco plant that is engineered with the DNA from Philip's uh, recently deceased grandmother, Dorothy. Uh, so this is the, the latest in progress of spirit molecule. So that's it for the slides. And I think maybe what I'd like to do is end with just a uh, glimpse. Um, I want to share this kind of teaser with you for a project that I'm in the midst of working on right now. Um, it's kind of tentatively titled Xeno in vivo. And it's about interspecies relationships and in particular about xenotransplantation, so the engineering of non-human animals to be sources of organs for transplantation into humans. So I'll just play a clip of this and then I'm really happy to begin a conversation. Tucked away in the forest, past the fields, outside Munich, a team of scientists is designing a new future pig, a pig with a human heart. It isn't really a human heart, but it isn't a pig heart either, at least not as pig hearts were before. These hearts are grown to be transplanted into human bodies whose own hearts no longer function. Are you still other if you become closer and closer to me? So that is the work that will be ultimately accompanied by a larger installation. So we'll have uh, sculptures that depict kind of the evolution of the pig um, through its uh, domestication. So over the millennia of interaction with human beings, the pig has evolved from a wild boar into the domestic pig and now further into the laboratory pig and into then this kind of future speculative pig. So the exhibition will draw out this kind of view, this long view of this interspecies relationship, and then speculate kind of about where that's going through sculpture and um, lenticular prints and video installation. So 
Wow. With that, <laughs> I'll say thank you and looking forward to talking Angela and uh, everyone else. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm really intrigued by your latest project and I can't wait to see what comes out of it. Um, thank you. There's great presentation. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, so just, you know, since you did the, the Lovesick project at the Science Center, I've actually presented that project a lot when I talk about the bioart residency. And I would say that, that, you know, people have different reactions to it, but a lot of people react with great concern. <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, you know, I know with Stranger Visions, you're kind of talking about how people can like take your DNA, but how do people react to lovesick when you're actually like having this irreversible process of like modifying DNA? It's really interesting you say people respond with concern because I have always had the opposite interaction. Oh, really? Where usually I share the work and then people say, where can I get it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really, that's really interesting. I have actually not really had anyone be concerned. I mean, not that they shared with me directly anyway. Mm -hmm. But I do think, of course, the project points to something that is concerning, which is, I mean, that if on the one hand, we can easily engineer this virus to do something that we might think is beautiful or utopian or aspirational, of course, we could also engineer a virus to do the opposite. And so, I mean, the kind of utopian gesture carries with it its dark counterpoint uh, always. So I think that that is very much present uh, in the work, even if it's not the explicit point of the work. Yeah, and I wonder if it was kind of exacerbated because you created this before the pandemic. So once you know the pandemic started and this this idea of a virus just spreading over the globe, I wonder if that kind of changed people's perception of the project at all. Yeah, I'm sure that it did. I mean, suddenly people were thinking about viruses, you know, and before I think most people weren't. Um, but again, I mean, mostly the interaction that I've had is people that say we need this now more than ever. You yeah. know, that we're, we've become so much more distant from each other now physically. How are we going to come back to, to being close again and kind of remembering what it means to be these these physical, messy, biological beings. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a process. <laughs> but I would be really curious to hear more about, uh, I mean, if, if the concerns that people had were about the potential of engineering like a different kind of virus or if there were other concerns. Um, I think the fear was that, um, you know, people, they were like, oh, have you tried it? Has, has a person used it on themselves? And I'm like, no, it's just a virus we created, but it's, you know, no one's doing that. And the fear was that it would just suddenly get out and it would just, you know, be out in the world. And um, I think the implications of that just, yeah, like you said, in, in any kind of a context are scary to some people. So. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so just to assuage anyone's fears, the virus can't propagate on its own, and it was only ever tested in uh, in cells, you know, in uh, in vitro. So we never did any kind of animal models or anything like that. So it was really much more a conceptual experiment, um, and this kind of yeah, I mean, a thought experiment basically, and imagining what is the future that we want to have. And so for me, it was as much about critiquing technology and our reliance on uh, digital tools, social media, these kinds of things, as it is about biology in a way. Yeah, and this feeling of isolation. Um, another question I wanted to ask you about, so, you know, you describe yourself as a biohacker and I feel like all of your art is, is, is active, is, is some type of activism in a way, um, but especially, um, I want you to talk a little bit about your Refresh Collective and kind of how that got started from, from your reaction to Ars Electronica. Yeah, absolutely. So that was like, oh God, maybe seven years ago now. Um, so Ars Electronica is this kind of pinnacle of the media art world. It's this festival in Austria that has been giving out awards for 40 years. And um, basically, 
almost every single one of the top awards that they've ever given out, which are like hundreds at this point, all went to men. So there was basically like one exception where they gave a, a prize to a, a woman solo. And um, so me and some colleagues of mine in the field, you know, uh, just got really fed up with this. And we thought we have to call attention to this problem. And so we started a social media campaign again about seven years ago called Kiss My R's. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was, you know, celebrating the great men of media art. <laughs> and, and so that caught on and that was kind of a, a had like a viral effect. But at the end of the day, the festival didn't respond. You know, the only thing that happened basically is they stopped replying to my emails and posted this ridiculous article of their own, um, basically like talking about how they don't get enough women applicants and this kind of thing, which I mean, just to say is nonsense because I, you, this is one of these weird instances where they make all of their data open. So you can actually go through and see who has applied. And so I've looked at who, <laughs> who applied and I saw many totally amazing women applicants in the field who just were ignored at that point. So then we kind of came back together. So my friends and I, we came back together, we retooled, we said like, okay, another year has passed, another group of men has won this award, what do we do? And so we launched the, uh, the campaign one more time we wrote a, a piece in the guardian that got a bunch of traction and then we said okay we have to do something proactive we can't just critique the problem and so we formed the refresh collective and started planning our own exhibition to celebrate the people that we thought should be seen and should be heard and in particular we were looking at narratives around the future using art and technology art and science and giving space to voices that are marginalized within the field so women, women of color, queer trans artists, uh, highlighting those voices and basically saying, this is where we're going to find the future. We're not going to find the future by listening to the same tired old perspectives that we've been listening to for centuries. So let's start a different discourse. And so that uh, exhibition was called Refiguring the Future. Um, and that was a, a few, about three, three years ago, that we had launched yeah. that in New York. It was a and, great um, exhibition. Yeah. I love it was it. a fantastic time also and and so then you know now the collective has kind of morphed i think through over the last year year and a half we felt like i mean first of all the, the exhibition and, and it was also a huge conference that we put on um and that was a, a ton of work and we felt kind of a need to recover after that but then also just over the last year and a half we felt like we need to just support each other I mean, we need to just be there like use our collective to check in and give people a chance to just talk about, you know, whatever is, is bothering them or whatever they're needing, um, needing an ear yeah, for. And so we, we kind of retooled as a, as a support network for the last year and a half and who knows what might come next. So, yeah, well, that's yeah. what people need right now. So that's amazing. Um, I know that my colleague Emily has a question for you. Yeah, <laughs> you read my mind. I think that's <laughs> um, yeah, I first of all, Heather, your work is incredible um, and just Thank so you. interesting and so unique. And I'm just sitting here wondering, like, how you got into um, the specific nature of your work and what some of your inspirations are. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, so it is definitely the outcome of a long process. So, um, I mean, starting with always loving making art, I mean, but also always loving writing and and reading and and to some extent also science. Although I would say, as a child, I didn't receive so much encouragement in that area, unfortunately. But you know, that came later. So, um, so starting from kind of having this interest in arts from a young age and then um, merging that in college. So in college, I came to realize that I also had technical and scientific ability and I was encouraged to take computer science classes. And this was one of these kind of really crucial things for me because I always thought that that was someone else's thing. Like that was, you know, probably for guys, not the kind of thing that I was supposed to be doing or that I would be good at. And um, 
anyway, I was encouraged by a friend to take a computer science class and I just loved it. I had a great time and was really good at it. And the teacher that I had then also really encouraged me. So then he said, you know, don't you want to take artificial intelligence? And I thought, what? I can't possibly do that. And that's really like someone else's thing. And I took it. And again, I just was so drawn to it. And I thought that the philosophical inquiry that was going on in that field was like stunning. And so I got super drawn into thinking about neural networks and genetic algorithms, evolution of language and things like this. So I started trying to put these things together in, in college and did some you know early works to that extent. And then that kind of evolved over the years and gradually also began to meld together a little bit more with my politics. So I always had a kind of activist practice that was separate from my art practice. And then through my master's, then I started, I started kind of realizing I'm working with algorithms in my work, but these algorithms are also political. Wasn't quite sure yet what to do with that, but I started thinking about it and talking about it, writing about it. And then in Stranger Visions then in 2012, this is this moment where this really came together for me as this kind of cohesive thing. And I think kind of reflecting on that as an artist, part of that came from, you know, originally I was really inspired by conceptual art and by um, people like John Cage and this idea of indeterminacy and kind of letting go of control as an artist, setting up the system and then letting it go and seeing what happens. And I thought, this is such a connection to thinking about algorithms that so you can set up this like algorithmic system and let it go, see what happens. And I was really obsessed with that and kind of didn't realize that no one was getting it, <laughs> that I would make these works and like, I don't know, maybe a handful of people in the world could really understand what was going on with them. And so with Stranger Visions, then finally, I kind of real, realized some way of reconfiguring the interests so that it could reach an audience more clearly. And so that was, that was like a major shift. So it was the two things. It was bringing the politics into the work so they were really integral to the form. And then also um, really thinking deeply about what the audience would get out of it and how to give this kind of visceral reaction to the viewer. Yeah. And in terms of influences, I would just say like, I was very much inspired in addition to the kind of classic conceptual art kind of thing. Um, I was very inspired by the early um, artists working with technology and with science in particular groups like Critical Art Ensemble um, or uh, Tissue Culture and Art. So I was kind of keeping track of the emergence of this intersection of, of art and biology very early on, even though for a number of years it felt out of reach until basically the growth of the, the DIY movement and the, the community biology movement. Thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's, that's super interesting. And, and also speaking more to kind of that relationship um, between you know, biology and the sciences and, and art, and it's so important um, you know, in making these fields more accessible to folks. And we have a really great question in the chat um, asking, you know, how can we encourage more creatives into the computer science space and vice versa? You know, how can we encourage more codified thinkers into the creative space since clearly there's so much value um, when those spaces collide and the incredible things that come out of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that is so important. And, you know, I mean, it's also about getting diversity into these spaces. And I can only really speak to my own experience with that, which is that, I, first of all, these fields tend to be so discouraging. I mean, it's so often these are spaces that are full of this kind of like tech bro mentality that's just kind of scaring people off with geeky prowess. And, you know, if you show up and you've never used a command line before, you feel really stupid. And that's, of course, not a conducive environment to in inviting diversity of any kind, you know, including creative diversity. So I think that's a big thing is really changing the attitude of the space and, and making these spaces into inclusive and welcoming spaces. And then for me, the other part really was, I had this great teacher. You know, I had this teacher who really, he designed his computer scientists with humanists and artists in mind 
so that he was kind of communicating these ideas of like object-oriented programming in a way that was very visual. And so, you know, it wasn't about, it wasn't like framed in a mathematical way at all. And I can just say that for me, this was something that I could really grab onto, that I could really picture like, oh, these are these like objects and they have these sub objects of, you know, it's like a, 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 a diet, more like a diagram and less, less like a formula. And so that was something I found really beneficial was to have this uh, teaching methodology from someone who was also, you know, not only thinking very visually and thinking about the context in the humanities, but also was very politically aware and um, like really interested in philosophy and these things also. So it was always, it was always applied to something interesting. It was never just abstract kind of computing for the sake of computing. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I have another you, question. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to come that that it, that it is so incredible to think the influence that that educators and the educational space has, and that they can bring these things together for people that you know they may not even be intending to. Um, so that that's just really wonderful to hear that. So Angela, you got. <laughs> this is moving on to a different topic. Um, and I don't even know if this is a question, but you know I'm really glad to see like where your spirit mo molecule project. What, what it turned into, because I know I saw it in the very early phases. Um, and it kind of reminds me, you know, I feel like a lot of uh, artists are kind of working in this space of like preserving humans after they die. You know, I kind of, I feel like I saw a Black Mirror episode where they uploaded themselves to a cloud and um, and then there's the, the Bina 48 robot um, mm -hmm. who, you know, I guess a woman's personality was kind of uploaded to this robot. So how do you feel about this, this urge to preserve yourself after your life is over? Yeah, that's really interesting. And also, are you interested in preserving yourself or someone else is also yeah. the interesting <laughs> question, you know, because there is parallel to what you point out also this um, obsession, like the Silicon Valley obsession with living forever. <laughs> that's the other thing I would, I would tack on to that. So I think that's a crucial question is like, is it about you or is it about your loved one? And so for us in this project, it's more about your loved one. So it's more about thinking, how do we go through the grieving process? And that is, of course, also, I mean, more relevant than ever now, as so many of us globally are trying to figure out how do we handle the grief that we're going through right now. And um, obviously, biotechnology is not the first on everyone's list. But for someone like me, it's very much up there, you know, there's a, a it's something I'm thinking about a lot, even more now, I would say, than before, is really how, how you know, being me and kind of having the, the interest and the um, emotions and all of the things, like, how do I deal with that grief with also this kind of um, set of skills and interests? So that's definitely still something that I'm processing. And I think, I think there's another project still coming in that uh, in that vein, but I'm not quite able to articulate it yet. Yeah, but it's very much something I'm thinking about. I would love if anyone else is a uh, is feeling that way as well. I mean, I know we have other people here who I'm sure are biologists and biotechnologists. And if anyone else is thinking about these things, I'd love your, to hear your thoughts as well. And anyone can feel free to unmute themselves and ask a question. Um, if you'd like. So I'm also interested to kind of hear what your process is. Like when you come up with a new idea, I mean, it seems like you must do a lot of research and like plan everything out and talk to a bunch of people. What does that process look like? So just, I can give you the example of, um, let's start with Stranger Visions. Um, so with Stranger Visions, I had this kind of moment of inspiration. So I was sitting in my therapist's office and staring at this print across from me on the wall. And I saw this hair stuck in the crack of this print and I became totally fixated on this hair and thinking like, who left this hair? What can I learn about them? And that inspired me then to come up with this proposal, which was at the beginning, not totally concrete. So the proposal started out, okay, what if I took this hair and extracted the DNA? What could I learn about this person from the hair? 
this was basically the research question that prompted the artwork. And so originally I thought, okay, I'll extract the DNA, I'll analyze it, and I'll make a portrait of the person. But I didn't know what that what portrait meant. That could have meant anything. You know, that could mean like a bunch of colors on a screen or something. It could be very abstract, or it turned out to be very literal. But that came really through experimentation. So I had this idea in mind, I had this proposal, and then I started trying to get people to support it because I knew I couldn't do that just on my own. I didn't have money, so how would I make it? So I started trying to get um, to send it out and propose it to different organizations, had some rejections, but then had uh, an acceptance from iBeam, this um, art and technology space in New York. So iBeam backed the project. That got me started. I signed up at GenSpace, the, um, the biohacker community biology space that had opened in downtown Brooklyn recently. And there I took this kind of crash course on uh, how to extract DNA and amplify it, analyze it, how to do the basics of genetic engineering. And I started working with scientists there and just talking with them, like, what did, do they think it was possible? What do they think I could learn about a stranger from a hair? Like, could I make a portrait of someone? And they would say, yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> and then kind of started guiding me through doing these different experiments and seeing how far I could get with it, basically. And that took a long time. That took, it was like two years of experiments, basically. Um, in particular, it took a long time on the, in the biology, in the wet lab. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was because I was starting from nothing. You know, I'd never done any molecular biology. And then simultaneously, I was working on the computer side. So I would spend some days in the, in the lab, and other days I would be basically on the computer, writing code, finding uh, different kinds of models that I could use for generating faces. I mean, this is how it evolved. So at first I thought I want to make a portrait, some kind of data portrait. And then I thought about it and I thought, I really don't want this to be some abstract thing that nobody understands. You know, there's a lot of data viz work happening in that moment. And I thought, I don't want it to be some kind of data viz thing. I want it to be something where people get it because there's all kinds of DNA portraits out there that everyone looks at them and they don't know what it means. And so I wanted it to be something where everyone would look at it and immediately know what it meant. And so that's how I started experimenting with thinking about literally presenting a face and then thinking about how would I do that and eventually coming to these full color 3D prints. Yeah. So that it was, but it was like two years of iteration and, and the student, you know, there's the, there's like the part in the wet lab that's like doing all the experiments there. And then there's the part in the computer of doing the, the coding things. And then there's the part of the physical part. And that took another, you know, that took a bunch of iteration to get somewhere because, you know, you have to start like printing these tiny 3D prints first and then trying to gradually scale it up. And then you hope that it comes out. You don't know if it's going to work or not. And finally you get, you know, you get a full color 3D model and you might have to then like apply the UV spray. Maybe there's like small details that need to be changed. Then you have to think, how does it go in space? And so then came all of these different experiments with like how to present the work in space and what artifacts from the process to include. And so there was a lot of experimenting that I did early on in presenting the work in different ways. And ultimately, I think that that actually continued past the end of the piece into probably Chelsea, which is the second work I shared, where I took all of the portraits off the wall and suspended them at these human heights. I think that was, that's like this final form that I think the work really should have. But that took lots of years of, of play and experimenting to, to get to that. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to do a data visualization. I feel like, you know, faces are the most recognizable image and that piece is like jarring almost. So you can't yeah. not get affected by it. Exactly. That was the idea that people would walk in and have this visceral feeling that that could be them, that that could be their DNA. Yeah. I think, Margarita, were you trying to ask a question? Oh, I just wanted to say hello, Heather. I'm so Hi, Margarita. You. It's so <laughs> incredible um, to follow you over these last years and um, oh, the time that you were here at the house and at your residency. Yeah, and all that's Thanks happened. For your support, the, Margarita. <laughs> and all that's happened in the world, and your work has such a a whole nother level of um of universality and intimacy all at the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. 
Yeah. Heather, I would echo Margarita's comments. Um, many times over the course of um, this past year, I've really thought about and reflected on your work. Um, so it definitely, um, you know, I'm sure like all great art makes a lasting impression. And so um, this year it was amplified even more. Yeah, thank you so much. You, you, it's always been in your work, but like for some of us, the message, what we've carried, but the pandemic totally uh, magnified, magnified it. Yeah. Definitely. Well, th thank you, Margarita, for your, for your lovely thoughts. Um, if the, we have two minutes left, um, so I'll take a brief pause if there are any questions. Um, but if not, Heather, I would ask if you, are there any, um, <laughs> is there is there a question that you would like to leave us with? I feel like your work is very thought provoking. And is there a question that you would like to leave us with rather than leaving us with an answer? <laughs> yeah. There's so many. Very good. <laughs> I can There's tell. There's so many. But um, I think that the one that I am, so the one that I'm thinking about a lot right now is about this line around what it means to be human. You know, so this general question of what it means to be human and thinking, you know, if we go for far enough back in time, we have this common ancestor between the human and the pig. And then these have broken off over time and, you know, we've become separate species. And now with genetic engineering, we're coming closer together again. So are we creating a new kind of common relative between the human and the pig? And what does that mean? or our definitions of what it means to be human and, and what it means to be non-human. Well, as expected, that is mind blowing. And I appreciate that and your work and I'll, I'll be thinking about that. <laughs> um, I'm sure Fantastic. Um, but thank you so much, Heather, for sharing your work with us. And thank you all so much for participating um, in our Cell and Gene Therapy Night. Um, and everyone just have a great night. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you, Venture. Thank you, Heather.